Hey everyone, and we are live. Thanks for joining in. I think we've got a really good episode. We've got Matt Pierce with us tonight, and we're coming at you live from the studios of Is Your Six <laughs> Covered. So, <clears throat> anyway, uh, it's been a while since I've done any videos or been on any live streams or anything else. Been really, really busy with the Bad MF, the data folders. For those of you guys that might be on the wait list for Multicam, those should be getting the emails on Tuesday of the week coming up. So you should get those. I've got a good inventory. Uh, those have been moving like crazy. So really appreciate you guys joining in. So tonight's topic is going to be about bullet apps, uh, ballistics apps, Strelock, uh, Knights Armament, things like that. But I want to get everyone's take on this. If you have any questions, we'll try to answer them as best as we can. What's up, John Townley and everyone else? So, Matt, what was your first experience with ever using a any type of ballistic app that in was shooting? was the Nordic Championship? It was. And so, guys, a little bit of uh, backstory to this. I think that was in 2018, 2017. I think it was, it was 2017. 2017. Uh, Matt and I shot in the Nordic Championships. You guys might have heard about that. Uh, they basically had open division. They had gas gun division, yep. and there was one other one, I think. And that was actually held at VIR at uh, Virginia International Raceway. They put on a great match out there. It was the inaugural match. I think it was the only one they ever held. Cool venue, really cool venue. It, it was. And when we did that match, it wasn't my first time shooting a long-range match. It was Matt's first yep. time. He actually borrowed a rifle from me. It was one of my bolt guns. Oh, yeah. And... We didn't have a Kestrel at the time. Uh, I had one and then I sold it. It's the biggest mistake I ever made. Uh, so what I did was uh, I had Strelock. So for those, we're going to kind of go over everything that we can. I do want to answer as many questions as I can uh, from you guys, but we're really going to concentrate more on the Kestrel than anything else. For those of you guys that haven't seen it, it's the one that looks like the little Russian star here. You guys see it right, or whatever it is, that little star, the yellow star, that's Strelock Pro. This was good enough for us to take the data and for me to actually win that match overall, okay? Uh, I was shooting a gas gun, 223. We're engaging targets. Furthest target was how many yards? I think it was 870, roughly, to the back burn. Yeah, about 870. And I was shooting a 5.56, I was shooting 77 grand, and I was actually shooting 69 grand, mm -hmm. sorry. I was shooting Defender Ammunition. And with Strelock Pro, which is a very powerful app, um, it was good enough to get the win out there overall. You actually did pretty well as well, didn't you? In third. Open Division. Third um, Open Division bolt gun using Strelock as well. Okay, yeah, because we didn't have a Kestrel at the time. So, this is the thing. You don't have to have a Kestrel, but I think nowadays if you don't have it, it's really going to hurt you. And working out of your phone is not the best thing, okay? Because you, you can get station pressures from Strelock when you pull up weather. So, like, let's say we were using Strelock, okay? I know it's going to be a little tough. I'm going to try to get this to focus in. This is a white screen, so this is going to be the worst. The worst it'll be tonight, I think, is, is what you see here. But on the top up here, you can go to the weather, and then right here you've got Medio, and when you click on Medio, it's going to click on the closest station pressures, temperature, humidity, pressure, and you can use these values. Now, this is not here, okay? This is not in this room. This is the closest place it can get it. Now, guys, I know you guys are going to say... Well, you can buy the dongles and you can plug it into your phone and it's going to get the wind there and everything else. It's something else to keep track of. And the problem with phones is, um, have you ever had a phone overheat? Yep. Um, yeah. Had it at the Bushnell and then... So you shot the Bushnell Elite. And you take it. your phone, you leave it out for just a few minutes too long in direct sunlight, especially in the summer or if you're in the desert. It's going to get an over temp and you're not going to be able to use it until it cools off. And you have to have cell service for these things to work right too. And it's going to pull from like X-Ring was saying the closest weather station, which I think in VIR was over 50 miles away. Luckily it was good enough, but if you don't have cell data or service, it won't work. Yeah, so if you're in a pinch or if you're just getting started in the long range, 
this will work. Now the very first ballistic app I ever used was the one by Knight's Armament. Um, it is called Bullet Flight. You guys can see the Knight's Armament logo down here. I think they charge $30 for this, okay? This had a different purpose. It would work very, very well, but this was in the days before uh, applied ballistics, okay? There wasn't even an offering of applied ballistics on the Kestrel. This was back in 2013, 2014. I was using it, but every single military light weapon is going to be in here. Everything from your, I mean, your machine guns, your M, you know, M40 A3s, uh, M, M4s with M50 with uh, M855. So all of that's in here, and it worked, but it didn't work anything, anything like Strelock Pro. So in 2014, now up until that point, we were always using data books, and these are great. I recommend that you learn how to use your data book, that you keep data, keep logs on your rifle, how many rounds are in the barrel. This actually isn't my data book. This is actually Matt's. It's at the front. But at the front, you like, keep it on the front? Yeah, it's a couple pages in. Right. And there's a lot of really good information on this. So he can keep all of his, uh, we're gonna have a focus issue on this one too because it's really bright. You can see all of his round counts and everything else. This is never going to fail on you with regards to batteries or anything like this. It's a good thing to have. There's a lot of notes on front in the front with everything from milling, milling man size targets. These are sold by US Tactical Supply. You can get them from Tactical Taylor. So I was using one of these for years and years and years. In 2014, I shot the Gastonia Sniper Comp, and there was a lot of military there. Canadian uh, Special Forces, believe it or not, they had five or six teams. They had five or six teams of third group, Delta. Uh, just a really, really great venue with some top, top-notch shooters. That was 2014. 2014, I was still using a data book. I had never even seen one of these. SF was using these at the time. Third group had these, and they were actually running them with... Um, Horus ballistic apps. Now, Applied Ballistics wasn't out yet. It was just starting to come out. Uh, those guys were already using magneto speeds and everything back then. And I sat down with one of them one evening and they explained how this worked. And it was a game changer. It was a complete game changer. But this can be daunting for a lot of people. If you go to any of the Kestrel videos, they're saying this is overcomplicated. Uh, it's too difficult to understand. And I, I think that's the farthest thing from the truth. The biggest thing is you need to go around, you need to play with it, okay? You need to start hitting the buttons when you're setting your rifle up. There is an app you're going to need to download. What's up, Rick? Good to see you. There's no Rick. Oh, there's Rick there. Rick's in Sorry, the chat. Sorry, I see it. So there's, a, there's an app you're going to want to download because it will make your life a lot easier, and it will look like the little bird or the kestrel that you see right there. It's black with a bird on it. You guys can see it. Now, first thing you do when you open this up, you're going to see this menu here, Kestrel Link Ballistics. Now, let's talk about this first because there's a lot of different models. Now, I was using a Kestrel before 2014, but all it was was a wind meter. It gave me um, temperature, it gave me dew point, barometric pressure, and that's it. There was no ballistics apps. So I was familiar with the Kestrel, so when they started integrating ballistic solvers in here, that changed everything because before then, the little basically ballistic solvers were thousands of dollars and they were just out of most people's price point. If you're going to get a Kestrel, I'm going to highly recommend you get either the 50, 5700, which is what this is, with applied ballistics and don't forget to get Link, okay? Mm -hmm. If you don't get Link, the problem is, and I know even Rick ran into this today because Rick is out in California still. Rick was working with a guy today getting his rifle all set up. He ordered one of these. He didn't order it with applied ballistics or with the link on there. So the problem is, is now his SIGs won't link up. Okay, so on the SIG BDX 3000s, you can take it, you can pair these together, you can use it with a Royal Cox Raptor, you can use it with uh, the Leicas. It gives it a way to talk so that it's tethered. Okay, so if you buy the wrong one, you're going to be screwed. Now, one with the applied ballistics and Link is going to run you about 600 and some change, okay? It's a lot of money, but trust me, they last. I have a couple of these. I number them so I know which one's which. Um, one, <laughs> two is one and one is none, right? So that's 
the first part of it. Now they just come out with a new one called the 5700X. It has a faster processor in it, okay. uh, but it's 800 and I think $99 or so. Okay. These are built pretty tough. About the only thing you're going to do to damage one of these is either run over it, step on it and break the cover off for the fan there uh, to get your wind speed, but for the most part they're pretty good. Um, I would probably recommend getting some type of screen protector for the front here because that will end up getting scratched if you get a lot of bullets in with it or anything else. I think when they're brand new they come with like a little cellophane. A little plastic yeah. thing. So Matt's got one over there and let's just go ahead and dig into it. So when you look onto this, you're going to see single target engagement, target card, gun profile management, connect device, the one that looks like the Wi-Fi. That's the one you want. But before you can do that, the first thing you want to do, now let's talk about the layout here. You have your illumination button here. In the center right here, this will do a couple different things. We'll get into that in just a minute. Over here, that is going to be, it looks like a little gear wheel. Just think of that as your settings button. And then you have enter in the center, left, right, up, down, and then your power button is here. So first thing you want to do is power it up. <clears throat> now when you power it up, there it is, the 5700 Elite. One thing I will uh, urge you to do is use lithium batteries, okay? Um, on the bottom here, there is a little lockout switch. You're just going to slide that over. And these are pretty darn weather resistant, but when you slide that over, that's going to release this back. And you'll notice a gasket all the way around. It's very similar to a handheld GPS and you don't want to use a battery like that. You can in a pinch, but the lithium batteries are better, and there's actually a setting in here to mm -hmm. tell what type of battery you're using, whether you're using lithium or an alkaline or anything else. Right now, this will not talk to my phone because I have not paired them. Now, this is where things get a little funny because we want to turn the Bluetooth on, but depending on the device you're using, you're going to have to tell it how to pair. So what I'm going to do is this right here, you guys are going to see the elevation, windage, you're going to see the target card. If I hit the light, I think it's going to wash it out too much. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure if that's good. I'm hoping the volume's good on this. Yeah, let's turn that off. I think it's going to be better without it. Yep. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit the settings button. When you hit the settings button, the very first thing you're going to see is mode. You have a ballistics mode at the top. And we can scroll over, you're going to have weather, and then the next one is going to be easy. This is not something that all of them will have, only the newer models have the easy. Uh, the original models didn't have that. So we're going to go over here to ballistics. We'll just leave it there for now. We're going to go down one to Bluetooth, and I'm trying to do this backwards, so just bear with me. And we have the Bluetooth on. Toggling it left or right will turn it on or off. If I click enter, you're going to see where it says PC Mobile. Okay. This is what you're not going to use when you're trying to pair it to your Leica or your Wilcox Raptor or uh, your SIGs. What you're going to want to do is hit over and there's a device. So you can connect your device connect, you can do your HUD connect. We're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to go back to Bluetooth and it's on. That's all we need to do. On the back side, you need to look at the serial number. On this one, this one ends in 2-1 because I want to make sure that I don't pair with mats right now. So what I'm going to do is on the phone, I'm going to hit connect device. And you guys are going to see that serial number ending in 2-1. I'm going to select that. And what it is doing, and guys, always do this the night before the match, because sometimes the screen will pop up here with a software update. And they take forever. If you don't have perfect cell phone reception, it can lock up your, mm. your Kestrel, okay? Uh, I have had some lose all the data. Make sure you back up that data. It's gotten a lot better than it used to be, but there, and it gives you a warning that you do want to back up the data. Okay. So we've connected to the device. So I've hit that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to gun profile management. Okay. And you'll see I have all of these different profiles in here. Now, in the beginning, back in the day, they didn't pair with that many units. I mean, I think it was like 10 guns. I think now it's up to 30 guns that you can put in here, 30 different profiles. And I'm doing this video because I had a lot of guys ask questions if I could actually do something with the Kestrel. It's really hard to show in a chat like this, but I'm hoping I can answer all your questions. we got Charles Tiffy in here. I can guarantee you he uses a Kestrel because it's a PRS uh, shooter, long-range shooter. Uh, you pretty much will not go to any event that somebody does not have a Kestrel, 
okay? And they're typically gonna be swinging them around and everything else. So now that I've got these paired, what we're going to do is we're going to build a gun. Let's say Matt here just bought that Tika, okay? He just got it, he hasn't shot it, he doesn't know a thing about it. So this might be empty for you, but in the top left right here, there's a plus sign. And when I hit that plus sign, you're gonna see that it says new profile, bullet from bullet or, uh, from bullet library and you have all this stuff diameter weight bc muzzle velocity well he doesn't know i mean let's say he doesn't know he has no idea so we're, we're going to click on new profile and we're just going to change that to matt so give me just a second go ahead and name everything and i and in this case i would name it matt tika t3 or whatever so we're going to say matt t3 all right, so I hit Matt T3 and return. Now I ask Matt, I say, are you gonna hand load or are you just gonna pull ammunition from, you know, from the sportsman's warehouse or whatever? And he factory. says, yeah, let's go factory. I'm gonna shoot 140 grainers. I might shoot 147s. So what we're gonna do is select from bullet library, okay? Now we gotta tell it what diameter it is. So that's on you to actually know that, okay? You know, is it a 264, is it a 243? So right there, 264, it's already populated. 264, 6.5 millimeter. And then now you get to choose all the different manufacturers. In this case, we're gonna choose Hornady. So we're gonna go Hornady 20 bullets. And then now you have all the list of the Hornady bullets in 6.5. We're gonna go ahead and choose the ELD match 140 grain, okay? Now, you've got G1, G7, and AB, Applied Ballistics Custom Curve. You can build your own custom curve. G1 would be, think of it as a non-aerodynamic bullet, okay? This is the easiest way to keep it in layman's terms, is, is if I were to draw a bullet shaped like this. Hold on, I'll show you guys what I'm, what I'm drawing here in just a second. Okay, so the top one would be indicative of something that is a G1 bullet. A G7 or G7 drag model is going to be something that has a lot more uh, aerodynamic profile. It's the ballistic coefficient's a lot better. So we're just going to say, hold on, we'll say a G7 curve. Once I did that, it input everything, okay? I haven't looked at this, so 264, 140 grain, it's choosing the G7 drag model for the ballistic coefficient, that probably says 2650, yeah it does. And zero range, and for some silly reason it always puts 109 yards, in case you're using meters I guess. We're gonna change that to 100 yards, and we're gonna set as zero, and I'm gonna save it. Now when you do that, it immediately adds it to this list. It's probably gonna be at the bottom, and sure enough it is. You guys see Matt T3, right? That is the easiest way to get information into this Kestrel. That is the only time you're really going to use this app. I try to use the phone as little as possible. When I show up to a match, this pretty much stays in the truck. I don't need this anymore, okay? But building that in this is a pain in the butt, okay? You don't want to do that. It's easier to pull that data library up. If you have a chronograph and you know your speed and you know that out of his 18-inch barrel, it's a lot slower than out of my 25-inch barrel, okay? So, if I click on this, you see it shows me that profile, but that's not what I want. What I want to do is get it into this Kestrel. So let me cancel that. And this is the part that a lot of people don't realize, right there where it says select. When I hit select, did you see those little circles appear? Well, I don't need all those other profiles. So I'm gonna select the one that had Matt on there. You guys see there's a check mark. And then right in here, you're gonna see at the very bottom, it says get profiles send profiles. In just that little bit of time, I somehow lost connection, okay? I have no connection with this Kestrel. It just does that sometimes, so you're just gonna hit the home button again. We're gonna connect to the device, make sure it's connected. Okay, not connecting. I see this quite a bit. And guys get really frustrated at this point. Do you remember over here when we were on device? We want to select it 
and go over to PC Mobile, okay? It's a mobile device. This is where a lot of guys get really tangled up because they don't realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm telling it to look for this instead did, of I this. Did. <laughs> he did the same thing. So now we're going to turn it on, maybe a little bit of learning there. But what does that say? Connection in progress. So now it is actually talking to my Kestrel. You're actually going to see that illuminate in green right there where it says connection. So I've selected Matt, and now I'm going to send the profile. Okay? So I hit send profile. And it's going to give you two options. Do you want to overwrite what's in here? Or do you want to append it or add it? Okay. We're just going to append it. So I'm appending. Now this did not have any of his information on here at all. Once I'm done with that and it had sent it, then what I'll do is I'll check on this to see if the profile actually went. So let's check and see. So when I go into this, I'm going to now go to my settings menu over here and you're going to see target. Wind, gun. Oh, look at that. You gotta see it, Matt T3. So his profile is in there. Now we just chose an arbitrary Tika. We didn't tell it what barrel length. We didn't tell it anything. This is where you can go in and change your twist rate. You can do it on the phone if you've got time to do that. If you're already set up, you do want to, before you import it, you do want to verify all this information, everything that's in here. Okay, so let's talk about this. Muzzle velocity the zero range, the bore height. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the bore height is going to be basically the height of the scope, center of the scope to the center of the bore of the barrel. Okay, so that distance, you want, and you don't have to be exact, guys. As long as you're within a quarter of an inch, you'll be good to go. But if it's one inch, you don't want to put 2.75. Okay, <laughs> typically if I don't know, and I'm just guessing and setting up someone's rifle very quickly, I'll just estimate it somewhere around two and a half inches. Okay, measure center of the bore, center of the scope. The next one is going to be zero height, zero offset. A lot of times you will use those when you're using suppressors and you have point of shift changes, um, things like that. And then twist rate, one in 11.25 right hand twist. This is important, okay? We're going to get into some stuff that we've never talked about before. Charles Tiffy might enjoy this. Maybe he can talk about it some. Twist rate is very important. Okay, Not only because you need to know what your twist rate is for the weight bullet that you're shooting, You know, typically like in an AR. You don't want to shoot a 77 grain bullet out of a one and twist barrel. You're going to have huge issues with that. Okay. Um, if it's a 77 grain out of a 5.56, you want a twist rate that's maybe a 1 in 7 or 1 in 8 and it should accommodate that. So know the twist rate, but now we're going to get a little more involved with it. Now we're going to get into what we call aerodynamic jump. I'm going to start talking about some things that you might have heard or might not have heard. I'm going to go and ask you guys without looking it up, do you know what aerodynamic jump is or AJ? Some people call it AJ. This is the easiest way to think about it. And I don't know how this is going to work with a whiteboard, the knowledge of the whiteboard of knowledge. If you have a right twist, okay? So I know this will be right this way. Your bullet is rotating to the right as it exits the barrel, okay? It's exiting, it's turning to the right. Let me get this right, okay? <laughs> Depending on the way the wind's going, if you have a left wind pushing on the barrel, that left wind will control your elevation, okay? So on a right-handed twist barrel, if the wind is pushing from the left, let's say it's a full value, what I mean by that, it's perpendicular to the flight path of the bullet, that bullet will typically go lower, okay? Because that wind with that spin is pushing this down, okay? Now, if it's a right wind, What's okay, up, Danny? coming from three o'clock, this is going to try to climb that wind and your impact will be higher. That's what AJ is or aerodynamic jump. Some people don't think it's important. <clears throat> Some people say there's too much in it, but it is a real thing. You can try it out there. Guys, you will see a lot of this when you get into 22 shooting. A lot of guys get confused because they're like, man, I don't know what's going on. This is my spin drift. The thing's way out here, but it's low. Uh, it's something to start thinking about. Aerodynamic jump is going to be knowing your twist on your barrel. Is it a directional? Most rifles are going to be right-handed twist. 
instead of left-handed. And just remember, a wind from the right going left is going to make the bullet climb. So is it different than spin drift? Yes. Okay. This has aerodynamic okay. jump has, it is not spin drift. Spin drift is the propensity of that bullet because it is spiraling and going to the right at a longer distance, it will start going to the with right. With no other factors messing. Correct. Okay. We're, we're not right at that at that point with spin drift. We're not changing elevation. Okay. okay. But wind will change elevation depending on the direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the spin. Does that make sense, gentlemen? Okay. Uh, Brian Mark says, "I just use the AJ. I just cut it in half." Okay. So, yeah, well, Abigail, it really depends. It depends on what you're shooting, how fast you're shooting, and how much wind you have, okay? Mm. Now, I don't want to cut hairs. I, what my saying is, is you don't want to be measuring with micrometer or calipers and then cutting with a chainsaw, or the, the saying is cut, measuring with micrometers and cutting with a chainsaw. But every bit does matter, okay? It does matter. And Charles Tiffy says, Abigail depends on environmentals, and there we go. That's what we just hit on. Now, we're just getting started with this and I don't want to lose anyone or anything else. No, a left-handed twist will not cut out spin drift. It'll actually spin it to the left. Okay. Your impact will start favoring left. Okay. It is just the spiral that's going on. The further it goes, the more it starts to favor that direction of the spin. Okay. So we have Matt's information in here. I have no clue. Remember we, we have just input, a bullet from Hornady, 140 grain, and we don't have a clue on if the velocity is right, we don't know his barrel, we haven't confirmed any of that. But just with this data right here, I'm going to get pretty darn close, okay? We're going to fine tune it, but I can tell you just knowing that cartridge and everything else, I haven't looked at this, but I'm going to say that at 700 yards with a 140 grain bullet, now we're we're gonna forget we're gonna forget weather we're gonna forget any of this other stuff because that all changes okay whether it's hot outside whether it's cold outside as cold as it is right now and I just took a reading uh, outside it was 40 41 degrees or so he's probably gonna be somewhere around 4.9 mils if I had to guess at 700 yards I'd say 4.9 so what we're gonna do is we're on Matt's profile right here okay I'm gonna go to yeah there's 42 degrees and I locked it. I do not leave this on live, and I'm going to come back to it, but let's just see where we're at. Range guard, and it's 700 yards. I estimated 4.9. We'll see. Okay. Two point. Oh, we'll see. 700. I need my glasses on. Guys, look at that. 700 yards, 4.96 mils. Okay. Now, you can go in and change this between mills and MOA, but that's only because I know the cartridge. I know that it's going to be pretty darn close. That's going to be close enough for him to be ringing pretty much any steel, and they don't always work out that close, but it's going to be pretty darn close. I already know that at 6.5, at 1,000 yards, you're going to be somewhere around, depending on how cold it is, somewhere between 7.1 in the summer, 7.2 in the summer, till about 8.4 in the winter. Okay, It really depends because how dense that air is. Remember... Cold air, the air is denser. Think about cold air in your house. It settles towards the floor. It's heavier. It's harder for that bullet to fight through that heavier air. Let's just see. I have no clue. We're going to go to 1,000 yards. I'm going to say it's going to be 8 point, I don't know, 3, 8, 4, maybe. Maybe. I'm just guessing. Okay, so I was off. 9 mils. But I wasn't off that much, okay? It's enough to hit a man-sized target. But there's a whole lot more we can do with this, and let's get into it. So I'm going to try to hold this and watch at the same time. Okay. So at the top, the very first menu on the settings, once we got his gun in there, was target. Okay. So target, you guys see there where it says 51 degrees? That is going to be the azimuth, and it's set for 50 yards. If we move over to the right, that's going to change the yardage. And we're going to say he's at 100 yards. Okay. And this is very important when you get on a stage or you're getting on a range or something. Now you can hold the button and it'll go really, really fast, but you're trying to catch it. So there's 101 yards. What I want to do is I'm going to pretend I'm shooting towards Matt here. And I'm going to hit the target button in the center. And what you're going to see is you'll see target. Target A is 101 yards. I can change that to 100. 
Direction of fire, 51 degrees. Well, that was based on some other data some other time. So I'm going to hit direction of fire, and you'll see units, degrees, capture, and compass calibrate. Make sure you compass calibrate anytime you change locations, meaning you go from Utah to Wyoming to wherever. You want to make sure you compass calibrate so anytime. You just need to compass calibrate yep. one time. Correct. Now, when you compass calibrate, and I'm not going to do it because I'm indoors and I have to go back out to do it, it's going to tell you to spin it. And you just have to spin it, keep it upright, just like that. You want to make sure you have a clear view of the sky. And it will count down the revolutions until it gets calibrated. And it'll tell you. Okay, so we've already done that a minute ago. So now I'm going to hit capture. And maybe it'll do it from inside of here. Point the back of the unit at the target. So remember, we're shooting over here towards Matt. And we're going to capture this. You see the degrees, how it's changing? Boom, capture. You have to tell it which direction you're firing because when you start taking winds, it's got to know what, what azimuth that's coming from so it can kind of factor in and help you along with your wind speeds. Okay, So it's very, very important to do that. Now, this will get you close, pretty dang close, but don't let this be your crutch. Okay, Because all you need is a piece of electronics going down and then all of a sudden you're like, I don't have a clue. Okay, you know, maybe you fall back on your phone, uh, something like that, but, you know, electronics or go to your book or something. Okay, so you guys can see direction of fire, 324 degrees. Okay, so this is L degrees, L cosine. So if you click on it, that's the inclination. So this will actually do an inclination on up or down if you wanted to do that. Okay, this is the cosine. You want to leave that one is good. Let me see if I can get this down. Okay, cosine. Okay, T, target speed. If you ever shoot a match that has moving targets, you can use this. And you can estimate target speeds by measuring what a mill is, how long it takes, time-wise, things like that. Wind direction, 12 o'clock. Okay, now we don't know that it's 12. We haven't taken it. So if we wanted to capture, we'll just go down to capture. And we're going to pretend that the wind is here. Okay, so I'm going to hit capture point the back of the unit into the wind for wind direction, wind speed one, wind speed two, start, capture, go. What I'm going to have Matt do is just blow, now blow really, really hard, and then slow down, keep blowing a little bit more, and stop. Okay, so we stopped it, and it's a one o'clock wind based on that. Now let's see what the speed was. It averaged one mile an hour as a slow, two mile an hour as a fast. You got to remember some of these matches are going to be 15, 20 miles an hour. Make sure you're pointing it directly into the wind, and it's going to take an average of that basically on wind speed one and wind speed two as a high to low. This is pretty important. I'll show you this in just a minute. I'm learning so much new stuff. All right, so we're going to exit. <clears throat> now, let's say I have to take this shot, which we zeroed it at 100 yards. Let's say I have to take this shot at, let's say, oh, I don't know. 700 yards, look at that, stopped it dead on. Remember we were at 5 mils? Now the wind is going to be not even a mil, not, not even a tenth of a mil left. You see that? Left and then right. So there, there's nothing. At 1 to 2 miles an hour, it doesn't affect it. But if we get those up, what it will show you is that low 1 mile an hour value and then that high 2 mile an hour value, and it can be significant. If you don't know when it's gusting, and remember, what it's doing here is not necessarily what it's doing down there or midway, midway. You need to be looking. You might have a full value wind on the left side of your face here, and then as you get to the target, you're looking, you got trees swaying like this, but it's the other direction. It happens all the time. It happens all, all the time. time. Those are things you need to pay attention to. Also, use your spotting scope or use your binoculars and focus at 100 yards, 300 yards, 500 yards. See if you can see the mirage and see what it's doing with that wind to give you wind indicators. Look for grass, look for dust, look for another shooter that is shooting at the moment and look and see what his trail might be doing. You know, the impact if he misses or even if he hits it, look and see what's happening with that, that impact, okay? That's gonna tell you a lot. Being able to make first round hits is what's gonna win you a match, okay? All of this helps but you need to do your job. Now, if you're a first shooter, sorry, tough luck. It just happened. Uh, but that just means you're going to be last shooter on the next stage. Okay. Charles Tiffey's always use your glass and mirage vegetation. I think I just said that. 
Uh, the guys that do this, we're not going to give you the wrong information, guys. This is how it's done. But let's just keep going on with this. So, and I'm trying to read on the thing here. So, Target. We've understood or we understand what Target does. We went through every one of these on what it does. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to exit. I'm going to hit the settings thing. We've got wind. Wind is the one that we just used. But remember, we just used it in Target. I can go into wind now. And let's do this again. Let me do wind direction and capture. I'm not going to let you guys watch and make fun of me. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this up. End capture. Okay, that right there is 23 to 31 miles an hour. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is that, no funny jokes. Guys, look at that. 2.4 mils to 3.2 mils. You're going to be somewhere based on that. Now look, look at what it's saying on the direction. It's going to push that bullet to the right. And remember, we're shooting this way. The wind is blowing left because I blew out on it here. It took the degrees and it's going to push that bullet 2.4 to 3.25 mils. If I had to take an unknown shot at this distance and I had this data and nothing changed down range, I would probably hold 2.8, 2.9 mils, send it, okay? That's what I'd probably do because we don't know what that gust is going to do, but at least it's going to possibly give me that visual. I'm going to be really dang close to the target. I'll be able to use my reticle to get hardest I've seen anybody blow. Ah, oh, you're funny. All right, no, I, we're all learning here, right? I got to do what I got to do. Puff, pass. Puff, puff, pass. That's right. So that's wind. Now let's get into the gun. So let's say Matt shoots at 700 yards and it's not 4.9 mils. Let's say he's got a really short barrel. Let's say he bought a, he chopped that Tika barrel off at 16 inches and is running really slow, okay? And he goes to fire that bullet and the, the Kestrel tells him 4.9 mils. He dials it in, his 100 yard zero is good. He's walked everything out and he's noticing it's starting to get off a little bit, but at 700 yards, he shoots at 4.9 mils and it hits the dirt five feet in front of it, okay? Well, if he's good, he'll take his reticle, get right back on that target, and remember where he hit. And if it's three mils low, then he'll say, well, dang, it wasn't 4.9 mils. We're going to have to add three to it, so it's 7.9 mils. Now, that's being very, very, um, that, that's, that's being pretty extreme with it because it's not going to be that much. But it might have been a mil and a half low or something like that. So we're going to correct that. We're going we're gonna to chew this out using muzzle velocity. Now, 700 yards is not it. Now, this is, guys, this is not a Todd Hodden at class. We're not going to talk about Mach 1.2 or, you know, 0.9. That's, we're, we're overcomplicating it. If you're that person, then you need to read up on that. The problem with the Kestrels is there's very little data in the owner's manual, okay? Um, it kind of tells you what the buttons do, but that's one of the downfalls. And there's a lot of people that don't know how to use these and use them effectively, okay? So what we're going to do... Terrain will fool the hell out of you on wind calls. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we're starting to get a little advanced when we start talking about what Charles is talking about. But when you start talking about valleys, or if you start talking about fingers that come out, you can have swirling winds that are going to change everything. You can have uplift, depending on how the wind's coming across the valley. That's a little more advanced than I want to get into tonight, because we're just learning how to program the Kestrel. Okay? That's all we're really working out, but good point there, Charles. So we're going to go back to the gun. <clears throat> the muzzle velocity says it's 2650. But we know when he shot, it was not 4.9 mils. We're just going to say he was 5.5, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to click on muzzle velocity. Remember, when I say click, we're just hitting the enter key in the middle there. So when I click on this, you're going to see units, feet per second. And this is very important, guys. This is a quick, rudimentary way to do it. Calibrate muzzle velocity. Now, at 700 yards, 701 yards, I'll do 700, it says his drop should be 4.9 mils. But we just shot it, and it wasn't. It is 5, and he confirms this. He bangs the crap out of that steel, and he's like, Ray, I'm telling you, I'm holding 5.4 mils. We'll just make it up. 5.4 mils to make this happen. You've got to wait. Be patient. Now, you see the muzzle velocity? 25.47. What we want to do now is we can exit out of this, and it's going to say, watch this, boom. New muzzle velocity, temperature 42 uh, two degrees, 
2547. Select. I'm going to hit yes. I, I want to choose that because I know that's right. It's going to say, are you sure? Yep, accept it. Muzzle velocity is now calibrated. This is called speed truing. Now, when you shoot that rifle, his 16-inch Tika, and he shoots it out of a magneto speed, and he's got it hooked it up, and he's like, dude, it's not 2,500. It's 2,600 feet per second. It's okay. Don't worry about it on that end. What we're trying to do is get it so that that dope is correct. He knows that it's 700 yards. I'm going to show you some other things too. So what we're going to do is we're going to exit. And what we're going to do is exit again. And we want to go down under gun. You're going to see range card. Now, before we did that with the muzzle velocity, 700 yards was 4.9. Always verify. This should now say 5.4. Boom. There it is. 5.4 mils up. You can always change this to MOA. It doesn't matter. Guys, don't worry if you're an MOA shooter or a mill shooter. It all works the same. You just got to make sure your data output is the same as what you're putting in there. When you do this, when you originally put that in there, you guys Switch see right there. there, it says range and it says, or scope data, elevation units. If I wasn't using mills, all I have to do is select this and go to MOA. There it goes. You got TMOA, you might say, I don't know what the hell TMOA is. That's true minutes of angle. It's got SOMOA, which is shooter's minute of angle. That's the difference of us rounding up or rounding down from one inch is a mil at 100 yards instead of 1.04, okay? And then there you can tell it what the clicks do, okay? We're not going to mess with all of this right now. Uh, you know what? I'm not even going to mess with it later. make sure Matt hooks up the magneto speed. All right, so yeah, make sure Matt puts up the magneto I have speed. I will tell on myself a little later. All right, so let's go back to gun. I don't want to leave it. All right, so we're at gun. So that's what muzzle velocity does. DM drag model. Remember, we're on a G7 drag model. We could choose this and change it to a G1, something that you might want to use in a 22 precision rimfire match or something like that. That's more of a G1 drag than it's going to be, and you're going to be in supersonic flight most of that anyway. Ballistic coefficient. Remember, this is not an absolute, okay? The only way to truly, truly do this is to shoot, get a muzzle velocity at your muzzle, and then shoot through a bullet trap at, let's say, 1,000 yards or 1,200 yards and go through the trap without hitting the chronograph and see what the speed is. And from there, you can actually extrapolate what the ballistic coefficient is. It's the same thing they do with manufacturers. They just use this OLR or OHELD uh, to get that information. That can change, and you can also mess around with BC truing by changing the ballistic coefficient. I don't do that a whole lot, but you can do it. The zero range was 100 yards, because that's what we set it for. The bore height, 2.75 inches. We could always change that. Let's say, oh, well, I just measured it. It's only two and a half inches, Ray. It's not two and three quarter inches. Just. Well, simple enough, and it's not going to make that much of a dang difference. Zero height, zero offset. Rate of twist, 1 in 11.25 inches right-hand twist. Elevation unit was mils. Windage units are mils. Calibrate DSF, drop scale factoring. Guys, this is so important. Uh, Charles Tiffy, I do want you... No, this doesn't have the R24 drag model, uh, which you'll find like on Streelock, which is used on a lot of the, the, um, the rimfire bullets. Uh, but you can still, this thing right here is just incredibly good. So, you have to watch it from the beginning. Yeah, um, yeah, this is good information because I haven't seen any videos that really cover it like this. So, Charles Tiffy answering the DSF. Yep, last match, same target. I sent one off left dirt, left one up right dirt, went straight up. So, DSF, this drop scale factor, okay? What I didn't tell you guys is when we trued that muzzle velocity for his 700 yard impact at 5.4 mils, it probably changed his 300 yard zero. If his 300 yard zero, probably that would have been about one mil or so if I had to estimate, it shifted a little bit. So what you're gonna see is as you get further out on truing that muzzle velocity, it is going to change that scale coming on back into 100. And we don't want that because typically, Closer distances, mm -hmm. they make the targets smaller, so that little bit of difference can make a huge difference. Guys, I'm going to oversimplify this for you. I want you to think of it as 
I'm gonna lock it in at 700 and tell it what it is at 700, even though I trued the muzzle velocity at 500. That way it doesn't mess with what's in between five and 700. You're locking these little points of data in with that DSF, and guys, this is very important for precision rimfire because you have huge drop differences from 300 to 400, or 300 to 350 for that matter. It makes shooting long range look like a joke, okay? I mean, how many times do you take your 6.5 Creedmoor out and you run out of dope completely? Yeah, okay. 150 to 210 is. You're typically, gonna, if you're running a 20 minute of angle base or a 10 MOA base, I can tell you that with most of your typical 6 Creedmoors and all that, depending on the scope and all that, you're typically going to run out somewhere around 1,600 yards. You're just not going to have enough elevation in your Vortex Razor or your ATAC R almost to a mile. But on a mile, you'll come up short on a 6.5 Creed more. You'll also come up just a little short maybe on a 6 Creed more. In a 22 rimfire, you're probably going to run out at 400 yards, and you still got another 100 yards left, and that's when that thing's really falling. So the DSF is important. So what we're going to do here is we're going to calibrate the DSF. And we're going to say at 700 yards, we're going to say it's, you know what, we're going to have to go up higher. We're going to say we shoot this at, here we go, this is it. This is a perfect way to do it. We're going to say at 1,000 yards, just bear with me. We're going to say at 1,000 yards, you know what, let me, let me stop for just a minute. I'm going to show you real time what happens here. Let me go back to gun. I'm back on gun. And we're going to change the muzzle velocity. We're going to calibrate the muzzle velocity. But we're going to change this to 1,000. I want you to watch this. Okay? Now remember, we haven't messed with the other one. I was going to, but this is really going to show you guys what's happening. When I go to 1,000 yards, okay, it's calling for 10.4 mils. Okay? That's crazy, but that's based on that 2547, okay, 2547. If I drop this down, what it's going to do is, let's say we get it back down to, what was it, 9.3 or something? I don't remember. Matt, you remember? Mm -mm. i tell you what, we're just going to call this 8. Because that's a real world. 8 mils. You see how it goes fast, guys, hard to catch it. So eight mils at a thousand yards, muzzle velocity 2793. So now we're, we're looking at the hand load, right? We're gonna exit, select, yes, accept. Now, of course we know what that did at 700, right? At 700, this is going to be stupid now. Now it's going to be, boom, 4.3, you see that? Instead of that 5.3, we're an entire mil off. But if we go, let's go to, let's go back to gun. I'm trying to do this upside down, guys. Just bear with me. We're going to go to mat, muzzle velocity, BC. We're going to go here to drop scale. Okay. Calibrate. And we're going to say at 700 yards. Bear with me. There's no keyboard for me to enter this. All right, so if I go to 700 yards, now remember, this is just the setup before you shoot your match. Not the day of the match, not right before you shoot it. This is when you're at the oh. range, getting everything done. And we say the range, and then our drop was, what did we say, 5.3 mils. I'm just getting it close, guys. Okay, boom, calibrate DSF. You see that? 1.23, we're in numbers we shouldn't even have, okay? We're going to accept it. Exit. Let's see what happens now. Let's go to range card. Range card. You know how hard it is to do this upside down? You see that's still 4.3? That didn't change. Nine hundred and a thousand. What do we have? 8.1. So it changes it. What you want to do is you want to try to calibrate the DSF <coughs> at the furthest distance you can. We did it the opposite way. We did the 700 and the thousand. You saw it didn't work because you're never gonna have a BC of one point something like that. It's just insane, okay? So you gotta know how to use that DSF and when to use it. Basically what I'll do is I will confirm my data, like when we're shooting these rim fires, we confirm it every 50 yards starting at 50. Well, you're gonna to start to see these big anomalies when you get about 350 yards or so, it's gonna be way off. That's when you wanna say, well, at 350 yards, 
I was this many mils, calibrate DSF, and it'll kind of lock it in. It won't change the bottom stuff, the 200, the 225, all of that. If you just do it with muzzle velocity, that's where you're going to have a problem. <clears throat> Matt, anything you want to add so far? No, I'm learning. Um, last 22 match was the first time I ever used a Kestrel, and it was, it was a game changer. There's yeah. no way I could have done the 22 stuff from Street Boss. Yeah, guys, you don't want to try to do this the day of the <clears throat> match if you're not familiar with it. You're not going to hurt anything by hitting buttons on it. Worst case scenario, you just delete all your profiles, bring it back in. But you need to be well-versed with this. You need to be able to use it quickly. Something that I do, I'm not saying it's the right way, it's just the way that I do it. As soon as I get there, I'm going to compass calibrate. I'm going to go ahead and get direction of fire on the stage that I'm at. But I'm also, let's go ahead and start back at the beginning. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go right over here to environment, right there, environment at the bottom, and I'm gonna switch this to live, okay? You see I've got lock and live. The minute I went live, did you see the temperature went up to 73 degrees? Remember, it was at 40 when we were outside, 42 degrees. So I have it on live right now. What you're gonna do is hold it by the base. This is how you're things gonna get broke. This is how things get broke. <laughs> Uh, you want to spin this for about five to eight seconds, whatever. And what it's doing is it is taking a temperature reading and everything else, and I'll lock it immediately. So as you see the difference there, the difference was me holding it in my hand. Never hold it this way. If you look on the back, you're actually going to have a place for your index finger because you don't want your hand getting <coughs> up here and covering this. Uh, just me covering this and the heat on my hand, watch this. We're at 67, I'm gonna put it on live. Look at that, 70. Just because of the heat generated off my hand is doing that. You're not supposed to hold it up high like that. If I start covering it even more or I lay it in direct sunlight, you guys see it climbing at 71. It's just gonna keep going. So I take my reading, I lock it after I go live and I get it done. I do that every single stage oh, yeah. a few minutes before I shoot because you can have huge temperature swings within the course of a day. So like when we shoot on January 23rd, it's probably gonna be in the 30s in the morning and it's gonna get up into 50s or 60s by about noon. All of that is gonna change, especially with the 22, on what that bullet's doing. And it depends, very, very on, it depends on where you are in the lineup of shooting. Like I took the reading first thing I think I was shot last, 10, 10 shooters later, it had adjusted two tenths, three tenths? Yeah, roughly. two or three tenths, you're gonna completely miss with your the, target. With the 22. Um, yeah, and see, guys, we're not gonna give you guys bad information. Charles Tiffy does this, he shoots it, <clears throat> we shoot it. Always lock your environmentals. I see so many guys that just leave it live, and you know the thing is, you lay it in the sun, you do anything, you're, you're trash in, trash out is what's gonna happen, okay? You got to give you got to give yourself a fighting chance and get as much good information in here as you can. Okay, so we're locked. We're gonna go back to gun because we want to finish this out. Let me get rid of uh, Charles's. Uh, let's see here. Brian Mark says I'd always true my BC. I spent good money on a chronograph, so I trust it. With a chronograph, that's a known factor. The BC is what you need to change, but you can get away with changing feet per second. And I agree. I mentioned that. But there's a time and place. Typically, when a true BC, BC is going to be about 600 yards and out. Uh, I think Todd Hodnett and Litz, I think those guys are saying you don't really mess with the BC that much. I, I don't know. They're saying the unknown is the chronograph. But read their stuff. Watch their stuff. I'm just showing you what works for me. And, um, and I, I welcome the comments because we're all learning here. Okay, so we got muzzle velocity, drag model, ballistic coefficient, bullet weight. There it is. There's that 140. Bullet diameter, that's a 264 inch bullet. Zero, bore height, zero height, zero offset, right hand twist, elevation unit. So you're starting to see some of the stuff there. Now view the drop scale factor. So you can do this and view it and see where you're at. Remember we were talking about the Todd Hodnett stuff with the Mach 1.2? All of that is where you can view that. Now we're gonna keep on going down. We can delete the gun. I'm not ready to delete Matt yet, it's just yet. So we're gonna delete it. Environmentals, we haven't covered this yet. So far we covered target, we covered wind, we covered gun, we're getting into environment. When you get into the environment, you can lock it, unlock it, you can select it if you want, and you can see latitude, temperature, pressure. And, and guys, you're gonna see pressure changes 
huge differences between shooting on the East Coast and shooting out West with barometric pressures. Their pressures are in zones so low that if they had the numbers that we have out here or over here in the, the South, it, that'd be like a hurricane or something. I don't know because <laughs> it's going to change everything. It'd be wild. You know, my thousand yard dope at, you know, in Wyoming or in New Mexico is nine tenths off from what I shoot back at home. I mean, that's a lot. Okay. So make sure you're checking that. Make sure you're verifying. That's why they usually have a zero day on these long range matches. There's spin drift. I have it on. <clears throat> we talked about that phenomenon and what's going on. Don't worry about spin drift up close. I see so many guys saying, oh, I'm missing to the right at 250 yards because of my spin drift. That's a non-issue then, okay? Uh, spin drift is not going to come in until later. You will see it in here if you have that on, where you can see how much it's influencing it. But remember, you got spin drift, you got wind. Sometimes it can cross itself out. All right, so one target. So right here, wind capture, one target. You can do multiple targets. Now, Charles Tiffy might do this. Some of these other guys, Brian, might do it. You can go into your app, and you can actually go into the actual Kestrel itself, and you can choose target cards. Now, if you do target cards, what you can do is basically you get on a stage, and you could say first target's at 290, second target's at 450, and go ahead and get that and then put it in here. Now there's a little subscript up at the top. You guys see, let's see here, let me exit out of this. You guys see that A in the corner right here? Those are your targets. You get A, B, C, D, E. You can choose that if you like and quickly go through it if you want. I, I don't use that feature because I'm usually doing something else. I'll show you how I do it. But <clears throat> there's environmentals, we covered all of that. Range card's gonna be your dope card. Basically you can go up and down and some guys are like, man, I, I like my steps a lot, a lot different. And it's not hidden, but if you've got your range card, it's trying to calculate right now. All right, so there's 700, 4.2. If I say, well, look, I don't need a 25-yard gap. I want 50 yards. Whatever your preference is, when you click the center button, that will allow you to change your step or your increments. It will only allow you, allow you to go down so far. 10 is Great for 22, but it takes way too freaking long if I have a 300-yard target to get down to 300 yards. You see that? It's like taking forever because I'm just going to be giving me every 10 yards, I'm getting an elevation correction. See that? So there it is. All right, let's exit out of that. So that's your range card. Coming on down, you have a target card. Do you remember what I was just talking about with the ABC and all that up here? You can build a target card. And this target card, you can put on there different distances, whatever you want, if you want a quick reference. Yeah, I don't use the range card on the Castrol. Yeah, see, guys, I've never spoken to Charles Tiffy about this stuff, but I know he does it. We're all doing pretty much the same thing. So on the ballistics, you guys can see here, it's got your wind out in here. It's a way for you to kind of verify everything and see there it is, the aer aerodynamic jump, the Coriolis, vertical and horizontal, your spin drift, your trace, your drop, your lead on a target for moving targets, time of flight. So for that shot, it almost takes a second. It's 0.91 seconds at 700 yards. Um, and then this remaining velocity, that's how much velocity it has once it reaches that 700 threshold, because that's where we left it at. Remaining energy. If you're, if you're one of those guys and you want to know it, great. This is a way to good. Maybe, maybe you want to figure out if your 6.5 is capable of killing this elk and you need this many foot-pounds of energy. That's something good to know because you don't want to shoot it with something that's underpowered at this distance, okay? You still want it to be ethical and humane. Now, that's it. That's the bottom of the chart. Manage guns. This is how we go in and we change all the guns. Now, I had the CZ455 in here from Mini X, and then we have Matt. I can add multiple guns in here if I want, but that's how you're going to manage those guns. That's it. Guys, that's everything about the Kestrel in a, I say quick, that took us almost an hour. And I know if you guys, you know, a lot, we probably lost a lot of viewers. I have 100 viewers in here, and I do appreciate each and every one of you. But I just wanted to show you it's not as bad as you think it is. Just get in there and play with the buttons. Um, and, and you have to. You're going to have to do that. Give me just a second.
Okay, so backlighting is here. If you shoot a lot of night matches, you can change this from white to red, okay? Now you can do this in the systems menu. We haven't been into that a whole lot. This is the one where we had the mode for ballistics. We had the Bluetooth. We didn't talk about the data port. You can hook this up to a, to the, to a data port if you don't have link on it. It's the only other way to get it in there. You have memory options. So you can auto store and everything else. The graph scale is going to basically tell you what your minimum and maximums are. So if you know that, okay, this is an important one. Let's say you go to a place where the altitude is, I don't know, 11,000 feet. Well, it's not set up here in the scale. It's only set up to 9,800 feet or 9,800 uh, feet of elevation. So that's what we're getting into here. You got density altitude. That's in graph scale. Display. Here it is. There's that display we talked about. Auto shut down in 15 minutes. You can adjust the contrast. We can go from red to white. So now if I exit here and I hit my backlighting, which is this one. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's actually red. It's an orange. Orange is the easiest on the eyes. No doubt about it. It's almost a red color. You can't see it uh, in, in this light here. Almost done, guys. Almost done. Michael, I think it's Kennedy. The cursor's on it. It's got a good question. Okay, right here. Time and date. Go ahead and set all of this. Compass calibrate. Accuracy first is that stuff that Todd Hodnett does uh, with accuracy first. You can run it on or off. I don't use it. Uh, measurements, this is where you can, oh geez, it skipped. We've got, when she, you see all the, all the stuff you can put on the measurements. Units, this is when you're going to, this happens a lot. It starts reading meters instead of yards. Just choose global and choose imperial or metric. You see that? And then you can apply. You guys, you got to remember I'm doing this upside down and facing you. It's tough. Exit. Language. Humidity calibration, make sure you do this in a place that has a known humidity. You don't want to be outside doing this. You want to do it in a room where you've got a, a measurement of the humidity. Factory restore, we don't want to do that. Battery, this is where we talked about earlier. We can choose from nickel metal hydride to lithium to alkaline batteries. It has an alkaline in it. It's good to go. If you go into the system, let's see, there is one in here. Let's see if I can find it. There's actually a game in here with the latest update. It's called Snake. If you're one of those guys just killing time, I can't tell how many matches we've been to where they get just backlog like crazy. And you might be at a stage three hours. On some of these ruck matches, three or four hours from one stage to another. You're typically <laughs> going to take a nap or you might want to play a game. And that's got that game Snake on there where you can play it. No big deal, but a lot of people don't know that it's on there. Where are you guys buying the cheap ones? Do you keep Spindrift off? Uh, where do you guys buy the cheap ones? I don't know what he's talking about. Is he talking about the Kestrel? Uh, I'm not I'm sure what you're talking right. about, San Miguel. Um, Bill Sweeney, do you keep the Spindrift off? Uh, I don't. I just keep mine on, but I've been playing around with it. I don't know what I'm going to do yet for the match that's coming up. Let's see. Yes, yes, yes. Do I need a Kestrel as a newbie? Great question, Michael. Just starting to learn the math, but external factors don't spare beginners, and I intend to do PRS eventually. You're, you're going to, if you're going to embrace it, you're going to want a Kestrel, okay? You can do it with Streelock. You can do it with Applied Ballistics app. I have that on my phone as well. The user interface is not as good, but it's pretty much the same program that's on the Kestrel. Just remember, some of the environmentals your phone or uh, might or might not have. You know, some of these Androids do a good job with, actually better than the iPhones on some of the things that they'll do as far as temp and things like that. Yeah. You just have to play around with it. But I wouldn't show up without it, okay? Something. You need a ballistics app of some sort. Your book is not going to get you close enough because the further you get out, the bigger your drops are going to get. Yeah. And, you know, if you have a known dope to add on previous engagement of 750 yards and your target's at 730 yards, you're probably going to miss it. Or you're going to have to say, well, I'll just aim a little low on it and use that dope. You don't want to do that guessing game. Try to knock out as many of those variables yeah. as you I can. Th I think if it's in the budget and 
you're looking to possibly get one, I would just go ahead and get one. But it is very doable with Street Lock or some kind of other ballistic app. Yeah, so Charles Tiffy hit it on the head. Remember I was talking about the dongles earlier? A lot of those will plug or Bluetooth straight into your phone, and so you can get wind, you can get temperature. Um, so that's good. It's just something else you got to keep up with. Make sure you know that that interface is working Well, there was for you. The, um, the SF gentleman that gave me his old wind meter kestrel it wasn't ballistic yep. but it would plug into the phone and i think it interfaced with street lock somehow yeah yeah and so somebody actually gave him one at the match mm -hmm. before he had a kestrel um i mean you you meet the nicest guys at these matches oh, yeah. man you really do phenomenal people and he was like no i can't take it and the guy's like no i take it man i don't need it i never use it anymore because i've got a newer one all right let's see upgraded from a 5500 you can use a weather flow meter no, LZ USA. It is a one-time fee. Yeah. They have the basic, which is not going to do a lot, but you can get Street Lock Pro, and I think it's eleven ninety-nine. Um, it's a very, very easy app to use. Applied Ballistics, like I said, it's a great app. It's just that the user interface is horrible. I mean, when I'm trying to do something really quick on the fly and set somebody up, I'll do it with the Street Lock. And the Bullet database that it has is it's a great library that's in there. Um, it's got a good scope well. reticle library as well. Yeah. All right. So, have you played with the Hornady Kestrel? I have not. And as a matter of fact, there's a new one. The, the Ruger Kestrel just came out, I think, as well. And remember, that new 5700X is out. Uh, I haven't played with the Hornady. Hornady uses that DOF, 4DOF. I know some guys love it. That, he's still trying to figure this one out. Yeah, <laughs> he's still trying to get caught up on that one. And, guys, you know, you don't want to chase the equipment so much. You know, we've had some talks on here about the different bags and all of that. Just get comfortable with one bag. It's nice to have all those tools available to you, uh, but like for this match that we're getting ready to shoot in a couple weeks, I'm just gonna take one or two bags for myself and Mini I, X. I think it's almost a hindrance. It can be. When we went it to the last be. one, we took a Dang. big bag with a bunch of shooting bags and it was like, man, which one do I use? Michael Kennedy, much appreciated. Uh, not necessary, but thank you. Uh, all right, so here we go. I, I do want to cover one thing. This is not me showing off this product. You guys have seen the Bad MF, which, like I said, these are going to be shipping. Whether you use this or something else, I, I don't care. I'm just going to tell you how it works. This is what you need to do. This is what you're going to want to coffee do. Can you hand me that right there? Victory. Coffee is the... <laughs> I hear you. Thank you, coffee is the path to victory. I appreciate it. So, Kestrel, available. Don't store it in the sun. Don't leave this baking out in the sun or whatever. However you store it, I usually keep it in a bag of some sort so that it's shaded. Uh, I don't want this thing heating up unnecessarily. I sight in, get a muzzle velocity at certain temperatures, always update the environmental. My question is, do you have to save temp on site in the app for it to always be accurate? No, it will give you a good baseline, but you don't want a huge swing. What you don't want to do is you shot yesterday and you took it and it was 80 degrees and you go out the next morning and your match and it's 25 degrees out, it's going to be off significantly. Uh, so you want to try to, if that temperature, you might not be in the same location, but if the temperature might be close, because everybody starts in the morning at these matches, it's typically colder. Uh, even in the summer months, you're going to have big temperature swings. Try to get that, that temperature in the morning. So, you're going to need your Kestrel. I'm going to lay it out for you on how this works out. I'm going to back up so you guys can see me. You're going to get to a stage. All right, let's say we've already had our shooters meeting. We're ready to go. Matt's going to be the first shooter. The, the, the RO is going to be reading verbatim. If you didn't already get a matchbook, so for like this match is coming up in two weeks, we, have a match we already have the matchbooks. We've actually already shot some of the stages. They not only give you the distances, they give you the target sizes. And one of the stages was ungodly hard. And I was like, <laughs> I, was ready I mean, we did okay. But I told Matt, I was like, dude, there ain't many guys going to do well on this one. Well, we got an update in the email two days ago or yesterday. Up the part time. And they changed the part time because I was like, Drew, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but because it was like so tough, you're taking a tire, and then what you're doing is you're picking it up. Now remember, you got your rifle in your hands, so you might want to set it down. You're going to pick up the tire with with no support. You're going to now shoot at a target 125 yards twice, 
And then what you're going to do is now you're going to rotate the tire 90 degrees. You're going to try to balance your rifle up here and you've got to shoot 175 yards twice and 200 yards twice. Then you've got to lay the tire down and get on the prone position on top of the tire. But balancing a tire like that, especially for like Mini X who's 14 years old and she's trying to hold a rifle that's just way too heavy. I was like, set the rifle down and balance the tire. Well, the tire was just too heavy. So, anyway, long story short, we get there. Shooters engage 10 targets from five different positions, two rounds each, hit or miss. Okay, what I'm essentially saying is I have five different places I need to shoot from, and they'll say they're indicated by orange spots or whatever. He's got to take two from this one, two from this one, two from this one, two from this one, two from this one. So you're going to shoot 10 shots total, but it might only be one target. You will have some stages like that. So all you got to do is at that point, I'm, I'm making it simple for you guys. We're going to say that target is 650 yards. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my Kestrel on. It's on. I'm going to give it a second to boot up. And then I'm going to go down here to, this is what I do. Maybe Charles, you can chime in. I'm going to go to Environmentals Live. I'm going to spin it up. It's first thing in the morning. All right. And good enough. And I'm going to go ahead and lock it. I immediately lock it. And we're only shooting this one target. What did I say? 625? 600, 600, 600 yards? What did I say? 600. 600 yards. My range card says at 600 yards. Give me just a second. Remember, this was a made up gun, guys. At 600 yards, we're at 3.2 mils, okay? Which that's six creed more territory there, probably. So what I'm going to do is 3.23. Don't read too much into it. What I'm going to do is on that, because I only have one target engagement, I'm probably just going to dial in that 3.2 on my elevation. I'll take a look at the wind. I'll make sure, because I'm not the first shooter. He is. We already called that. You know, they'll go by the order of the last name or whatever, random. My eyes are going to be focused on him when he's shooting. Even if I don't know this cat, I want to see what his first shot does. First shot out of the gate, first shot of the day. Did that thing go right? Did it go left? What happened with the wind that I possibly didn't see? I want to have my tripod set up. I'm going to fight my way because everybody else is going to be trying to get behind this cat shooting the stage because they want to see as well. They're looking for trace and all that. So you're going to see this <laughs> plethora of tripods, tripods yeah. behind the shooter. And, you know, don't be afraid. I mean, you don't want to start crowding people, but he's at the shooting position. You want to try to get in a position that's almost directly behind them. If there's a guy over here up high, hey, I'll make these legs low and get low, and I'm just going to be watching when he's shooting because I know that I'm the next shooter behind him, and if all of his shots, hit or miss, if they start hitting right on the steel or left on the steel, I'm going to be like, ooh, that wind is pushing, let's say it's hitting right. The wind's pushing a lot harder. If he's no dummy, he's probably holding for wind, but maybe he just barely held enough. So I might add a tenth or two tenths. Um, that helps a lot. If you can see, hey, you're taking the information you have and using it to your advantage. That's what you're doing, okay? Now, let's change it up. Now they say, all right, so for stage, let's say we're done shooting. For stage two, what you're gonna do is you have a target at the circle steel with the yellow post. It's 536 yards. Then you have the blue diamond at 725 yards. What you should be doing at this point is you need a data card like this, okay? And what you should be doing is either in a notebook, most of us carry some type of notebook. I don't usually. I usually take my data card, and as the RO is calling it out, we're going to say circle at 439, diamond at 672, square at, uh, I don't know, 790, and then you want to go for the, uh, when we were out in Utah, you want to go for the deer, the elk at 1,000. Okay? You guys understand the course of fire? Yep. All right, there it is. So now I've got my card. I've got my circle at 439, my diamond at 672, the square at 790, and what looks like a nasty looking elf at a, uh, elk at 1,000 yards. I'm now going to take that data and I'm going to go to this Kestrel. I'm going to spin up my environmentals again, and I'm going to read it. And I'm going to make up a bunch of dang numbers here. But what I'm going to say is, I'll say, I don't know, 3.5 and 672. I'm going to call that, I don't know, 4, 5, and 6, 9. 
and seven, eight, okay? So there's the data card. That is going to mount onto my rifle, okay? Hold on for just a second, guys, because I'm going to show you. Go ahead. And and one thing with uh, stage planning that I'm going to tattletale on myself, Ray and I, we tend to shoot the same, but I think our stage planning is a little bit different. I tend to ride out my cards or my armband a little bit different than Ray. There is no wrong or right way to write this out. It's what works best for you. Just make it make it to where you can understand it and how you're going to shoot that stage. Leave yourself notes, okay? I have no wind data in here. I haven't gotten there yet, but this is the quickest, most expeditious way I can do it. When he gives me the yardages, I'll put the target shape and the distance on here. I'll have time unless I'm the first shooter, and even so, you're still going to have about five minutes. Uh, Walter White, my pleasure. I'm glad you uh, glad you got into rimfire precision shooting. It's it's freaking awesome. It really is. We're having a fun, we're having a great time with it. I would write it in code so people can't copy my card. So that's the thing, AK Double. You're going to see so many guys shooting so many different calibers and everything else. Nobody's going to copy anybody else's card because your rifle will be different, your caliber will be different. Uh, this isn't a secret. What might be a secret are your wind calls. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Charles Tiffy might agree. You're not going to see a bunch of guys going, it's 1.2 mils, hold left. 1.2 1 is what you want. That ain't going to happen. These guys are going to have codes all set up. They might say 12. Or you'll hear them say 12. Yeah. They're not going to share that with you. Um, you can ask them. In my very first PRS match, I'm not going to lie, guys, there were some pro shooters on, on my squad. And one of them, you know, started talking to me. Is this your first PRS match? I was like, yeah, can you tell? He's like, yeah, well, your barrel's a little shorter than what we normally shoot. I figured it might be your first one. And I said, all right, well, you know, I'm going to have fun with it. I said, I'm seeing that first target about 1.1 about mils. And he goes, I can't tell you. I don't know what caliber you're shooting. I said, I'm shooting 6.5. He goes, I'll tell you what I'll do. He goes, you tell me what you're going to hold, and I'll tell you if you're close. But I'm not going to give you the answer. I was like, awesome, that works. I said, I've got this calculated for about 1.1 mils. He goes, yep, sounds about right. And that was it. You don't want to handicap someone. If it's a newer shooter and you're there with buddies, you can share information. But once you get to, I think, to a certain level, people aren't going to just tell you what their wind is. I, I haven't no, seen No, and that. what I was kind of hitting on was being a newer shooter, There's it's a lot of information, the Kestrel, the... The stage planning, if you're the first shooter, writing everything down, just find a way that works good for you and stage plan that way. Yeah. So the very first match that Nordic that we shot, we went out late that night to a, was it a Dunham's? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We had to drive like 45 minutes because we didn't have these things. What we did is we went and went to a sporting goods store. A quarterback coach. And we got arm. the quarterback little thing that goes on your arm. And you know what, guys? It worked. It was good enough for me to win that match, but it was horrible to actually do. Because you shoot, then you literally have to do this and look down. Okay, now I'm not the young I don't have the youngest eyes and I don't have time to put readers on. So I can't get my arm long enough to read that dang thing, all right? Especially to have all the data in there. So using a holder like this or something that mounts, this is a Hawk Hill Custom. Uh, I have one that's coming out. Actually, you know what? I'm going to give you guys a sneak peek. It's going to be really, really unique. These yeah, are fresh, fresh off the press. Uh, just real quick. Ooh, take a look at that eye candy. So that's coming out. Uh, it's going to be really unique because this, it'll be similar to this. But let me go ahead and set this up so you guys can see it. So this is the Hawk Hill. It's not cheap. It's a couple hundred dollars. We're going to pretend we are a right-handed shooter. This is going to be on the left side. So the scope is going to be right here. And all I have to do is shoot, dial, shoot. Now go ahead and put your first dope in. That's going to be your first target. So that first dope is 3.5 mils, on, in my case, mils. You want to go ahead and get that in. If I'm already favoring or thinking, you know what, I might, I might want to be half a mil left because of the wind. You just need to remember that. Unless the wind's changing up, remember you need to know your direction of fire on those targets. You need to use that Kestrel to help you get some ideas. I don't usually put my wind holds in here. That's something I remember in case he's reading my card or something like that. Now I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> Last match, um, there was one stage where Matt, I, I went up to him. Matt was shooting a really good match. You guys heard about that. And I, I told Matt, I was like, 
Matt, hold, what did I tell you, 1.2 or something? Yeah, he's like, I was he's like, probably need to be two. somewhere around 1.2. Now, he was going to use one. I, was I think use, he was going to use one. I was going to use one. And the difference was he cleaned it. Now, that's not coaching during the fact, but I can guarantee you everybody that's friends, they're sharing that information. But if I'm not friends with him, I'm going to learn that by watching through that spotting scope when he shoots. Okay. And that's why I like going to the range, even if I'm not shooting, just getting behind some glass and watching their impacts or misses and reading the wind, seeing what grass is doing, foliage, trees, and start learning because I, I suck at reading the yeah. wind. I'm getting better, but it's... And that's something that takes time. Now, Charles hit this spot on. Maybe a half of a percent of the shooters dial wind. Everyone holds windage, Okay. That's what I thought, too. When I went out to Utah, remember, we had 25-mile-an-hour sustained winds. The way the stages were, la were, were laid out, you shot off one side of the ridge, and it was a full-value wind all day long. Everyone was starting off with over a mil dialed into their scopes right off the bat because that got them closer to the center of actually being on it. It's the first match I've ever seen that, but they're still saying that's the hardest PRS match ever shot in the country to date. That was a tough, tough match. Uh, I don't know because the PRS finale look, it was pretty damn brutal too. Um, you know, Chris was shooting in that one. The temperatures were, I think, below freezing and it was snowing. They couldn't even see the targets. Uh, and they had 20 to 30 mile an hour winds. In that case, guys were already dialing beforehand because it never changed. It was always the same until you got the second day and you're on the other side of the ridge and it was the other direction, okay? So having the data card is going to make a huge difference, having something like that. What I use for these are the Statler permanent pens. This will not wipe off. It will only come off with alcohol. Okay. So everybody that ordered one of these uh, from us, everyone has an alcohol pad in the middle pocket here. So if you ordered one... I wrote a bunch of thank you notes and a bunch of notes and stuff like that inside, but you can take one of these alcohol pads, and these cost nothing, guys. You can get them from Walmart. They're basically for shots or whatever uh, for somebody that might need it, but it's got alcohol on it. Always pick up your trash. If you don't have a lot of data cards, now these are good to save afterwards for stages. Sometimes you can remember that, but you just take this alcohol swab. You do this. That's the only way it's coming off. At this point, what I usually do is wipe it on my pant leg and... Uh, it leaves a little mark, but then it's ready to go for the next stage. It's that easy, but you want something for that data, okay? It's going to help a lot. Anything you want to add? No, I don't have a Hawk Hill. I'm still running a um, an armband, but it's it's more of a uh, geared for shooting. But I've noticed with playing and shooting a little bit more, when I'm dialing, instead of having the armband sitting on top of my arm. I'll put it on the inside so when I get up on the, the dial, yeah. I can read everything on the inside of my arm and go ahead, see what that target is, adjust, and I'm already looking at the other one and I already have it in my head. Yeah, absolutely. You And, and Charles Tiffy answered it correctly. However, mirage does happen in cold weather. You can still get good wind readings even when there's snow out. You can still see mirage. Uh, you need a good quality scope. You don't want something that's a cheap Walmart. and not picking a Walmart, but you don't want a $100 spotting scope. A better spotting scope will let you pick up that better uh, on seeing the mirage, being able to focus in on it and see what's going on down range. But great question. Great question. Uh, need data card with 3M hook and loop. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much all you need. Um, you know, there's some inexpensive ones out there that are $30. Um, you know, there's one that you can have it where it's just actually just dangling. I've seen them where they've got the little flex ties. This is a nicer one. Uh, the one that I'm coming out with is even nicer than that one. Especially when you're mounting levels, that, that stuff will fold every which way. Yeah, I mean, this thing, I mean, because it's, it's, it's almost like it's breakaway. You can fold it away, you can fold it towards you, you can turn it up to run a vertical card or turn it down. Uh, you guys know that I've been using this card here, which is e-paper. I have one that I'm coming out with as well. Um, if you haven't seen how this works, I don't have to worry about writing and uh, ink and all that anymore. Uh, basically, I'll preload the stages, which I will do for that 22 match. Yeah, um, since he has, since we have the uh, the shooter book, 
with I'll, everything. He can preload. Yep, I'll go to the map. Let's say I'm going to load uh, my six Creedmoor. Hold on, let's see here. Stage 11. Uh, stage 5 ELR. So all I did was I just preloaded that Stage 5 ELR. Uh, I can't. You guys can't see it. What I'm going to do is with the um, communication, I'm just going to hold this up, and you guys are going to see this. Maybe. Hello. <laughs> Wait a minute. Gotta hold my mouth just right. Okay, so what it did is it just changed it. You see it rewriting it? This uses no batteries. So now everything's in here. You see my notes uh, near to far two times move over, and I don't have to write it. And this goes straight onto my data card. Ooh, um, the, the painter tape behind it. Yeah, it's two-sided. Two a lot of guys use painter's tape, pull it off. They use clear tape, like tear-offs for motocross. Um, I, do, I do some e-paper projects. They have color now, too. Yes, they do, and they actually have flexible ones as well. So yeah, guys, that's it. I just wanted to cover it. And then also for any of that ordered the, um, the Bad MF, some of you are starting to see these in your packs now, okay? I'm leaving little notes for what it is, but if you ordered that and the Kestrel pouch, what this is for is on the back of your Kestrel pouch. The way I designed this is you can put it in there and these are like your keepers that you use for cords, ropes, things like that. Uh, what you do is you feed it through about halfway, halfway, and we're going to pretend uh, this is our tripod, which it is, and then now I can attach the Kestrel directly to the tripod, and it won't go anywhere. So that way I have it if I need it. Uh, the furthest it's going to go is to that first joint, but it's just something that I added in there because, like I said, designed by shooters for shooters. Uh, this is also Tegris line, so it also is, is rigid, okay? You guys have any other questions? Do you always dial or do you use the reticle? Depends on... Depends for, on the stage for me. Yeah, for me, if I'm going for precision, I'll dial it. And then if it's a short part-time, going for speed, I'll do hold over if the targets are reasonably sized. Yeah, and that's the same thing for me. I'd like to hear from Charles Tiffy on that. I never say I only do this. Because I do do a mixture of yeah. holding and dialing, but for mo for the most part, what I've seen is in PRS matches I do almost exclusively dialing. Well, the DMR match was and shot, the, it was all holds. And right? the sniper yeah. DMR style ruck matches, it's mostly holding. You got to remember those targets are a little bigger. Are you making a bag or accessory to carry a tripod and lab radar, aka the devil? Not at this point. Uh, let's see. If it's a no dial stage, I always dial elevation. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, there are some stages, just like we mentioned on one of the chats, where they might tell you, you can't dial. You have to hold or whatever the case is. Um, some guys will also do something like what they'll call like a MPBR, like a maximum point, plank, uh, maximum point blank range. And what they'll do is they'll look at a target and they'll say, man, all those targets are 14 inches tall. I can use this hold and I can hit everything from, you know, 200 all the way out to uh, 575 based on the size of the target. I might hit it high, I might hit it low, but I can just hold center. Some guys might do that. Yeah, Labrador. Yeah, Lab Radar. Did you ever come across the Irish SF guys at Sniper Comps? 2A Refugee, never. Uh, never competed against any Irish uh, shooters, special forces, military, anything like that. Uh, Joaquin, belts are last on the list. Um, I'm taking a huge delivery of these on Tuesday, so I should be able to get everyone's out and get all their emails sent out uh, by next week sometime. And then we're starting on the PRS bags, so the mm -hmm. rifle bags. You know, like I said, it's going to be a well-padded padded bag, 56 56 inches long. You're not gonna actually stick the whole just rifle enough for in. a scope. It will have the QDs up on the top here, but I also have the inserts coming for these for the AICS magazines and the rimfire mags. Um, these are coming as well. I'll have the final prototypes done next week. Uh, just there's a lot going on. That's why I haven't done any videos. I haven't had any time. KB32 says parlor just got taken down. Wow, guys, you know. 
you know, I, I don't normally get into politics, but you know, the way things are going in this country right now, holy crap, man, it's just crazy. I, I'm not going to get into it, but x ring what scope are you allowed to recommend for a guy with $700? I am tired of the flooded market. Everybody's scope is the best. I'm lost. Drown in which one? What I can tell you, I don't, okay, don't take this the wrong way. I don't have a lot of $700 scopes, but from what I've heard, there's tons. For $700, I think one of the best ones I've heard of so far is the Vortex, the Strikey Eagle. Um, in that price point, the 5 to 25, I think it is, and you're going to have a great optic, whether you choose Mill or MOA, that's an option. I'm hearing a lot of good things about Arcan. Athlon, Arkin, and you're going to be in that price point. Um, so... Yeah, I think you'll be good on that one. Are you going to sell or include cards with the bad MF, uh, bad MF? AKA the devil, every single pre-order, I gave them four cards. I uh, also run them a nice note and everything else. So anybody that got on that pre-order list, I gave them cards. Uh, the, the later ones, I'm giving them the tie wrap straps on the Kestrel pouches if they ordered those. And some people got some of the tactical tailor back straps on them. I didn't have a lot of those until I got them back in, but I'm trying to give everybody a good bang for their buck. And let's see here. Any recommended reading? Uh, anything, yeah, anything Kleckner is going to be good. Uh, anything Litz is going to be good. I, I can't recommend much of anything else. Mark V. I think he's talking about the Leupold Mark V. I don't know if you can get one of those for $700. Can you? No, that's not a seven hundred dollar optic, as far as I know. Um, well, I think someone. Yes, if you are on the preloader list for the multicam, you will get four data cards. I am including those. I've included those in every single order. Uh, I'm giving you four data cards with the Velcro. Matter of fact, where did it go? I think I put it back in here. I hate to, I hate to give away the secret, but. When you open it up, if you've ordered one of these, you're going to get four of them, and it's going to be situated just like that, okay? Uh, the other things I'll be selling on the website or have available, I want it to kind of be a one-stop shop for long-range shooting, so I am going to have the Statler pins, the black ones that I just showed you, like this. I'll also have the Tactical Taylor Mollies for the back, made in the USA. I'll also have the alcohol pins for this, and a slew of other things I'm hoping to add. Any good loopholes for around a thousand dollars? I don't know. I think you got to get a little higher in the yeah. loopholes um, to get. There's just so many out there, so many ma makes and models. It's hard to keep up with. Who's got what? Eight to ten weeks back order. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. See, M. Bailey said the Strike Eagle. Okay. So great, great question. SFP or FFP? What he's meaning is it is a second focal plane or a first focal plane scope. For PRS, for uh, ruck sniper style matches, I'm going to 100% say go first focal plane. There is nothing wrong with second focal plane and you can be a dang good competitor. I shot a second focal plane for the longest time. However, if you're milling, you're going to have to be on max power on second focal plane. Um, if you're, and you say, well, I don't have to mill targets at PRS. Well, I had to at Utah because when they had the movers, they gave you the size of the target. And you basically were having to determine the speed and everything else. So it does happen. Uh, in all the ruck matches, I can guarantee you you're going to be milling. A, there's always one stage that's dead electronics. Yeah. So I'm a huge FFP fan. For hunting, I don't like first focal plane. I like second focal plane. I don't hunt anymore, but the reticle stays constant, stays the same size. First focal plane on the lower settings, you're not even going to be able to see the numbers on the reticle. You're barely even going to be able to see the reticle. So I'm going to recommend first focal. What do you say? First focal. Uh, Charles Tiffy, what do you say? We will see what he says. Strike Eagle is great and it is 700. Yep. Why is that pin good? Brian Marks, um, I'm just funny about pins. It's a Statler Lumicolor. Uh, these are made in Germany. Uh, it's a fine point. So Boy. you see the F on there, and it lasts forever. Uh, it's not like, yeah, you can go out and buy these Visa Vis, uh, like this, these Expo ones, and these are wet erase, not dry erase. And that'll work, but these tips just write fat. 
And for me, on my data cards, I like to have really fine notes on there. Yeah, Charles Tiffy says, first focal on everything. Uh, what is X-Ring's website? It's very rudimentary right now. I only have two items on there, uh, but I will go ahead and put it right here. It is xringcustoms.com. And that is the website, xringcustoms.com. I only uh, will put things on there when they're available for sale. There might be a multicam on there, there might be a coyote on there, and I have the Kestrel pouches. Uh, it sounds like you might be new to it. The Kestrel pouch, what makes this one different is it does have uh, Tegris in the front panel here. It's rigid, and at the bottom, this is rigid. Some of them aren't, okay? Some of them are, are not as rigid as others. They all have front and back protection for the glass, though. Not all of them have it on the bottom. Uh, some do, some don't. And that was something in manufacturing they were running into an issue because you can see that little bubble right there. And it wasn't a clean look. But the way that these fit in here is it's perfect like that. And it's going to protect it. And you can put it on the it's side. It's an expensive tool. Yeah, I think I sell that for like $23.99, which I think that's one of the cheapest Kestrel pouches you can find out Cheap there. Cheap insurance. Okay, if I don't wipe my card for months, will it be harder to wipe it next time it depends on the card you use okay uh, and the pen or the the pen you use rather if you use a sharpie marker it will come off it will be more difficult to come off it'll end up looking like a dirty chalkboard uh, but you'll be able to get it off I have used some other stuff and you can get it off completely but it will take the uh, clear laminate off the front so you really only want to use alcohol on it or even hand sanitizer if you have a little bottle with you. That'll help clean it off. Uh, but you don't want to let it sit there for months and months and months. Two, two months, you're probably okay. If it's been on there six months, it's going to be a hard time coming off. If it's in stock, it'll be turned in three to five weeks. What's your lead time on a barrel? And Kenny, thanks for being in here. Um, I was going to mention something. I can't remember what it was now. Can I use hops number nine solvent? Uh, yes, you can, and it will remove it, but if you get too aggressive on it, what it will do is it will strip the clear off the front. Uh, you can still use the card, though. Any tips for glass fogging up in the field? Yes. Okay, so especially with now with COVID and all this other stuff and having the mask on, if you wear glasses, you know how it's going to fog up. You guys that ski probably know everything about cat crap and all this other stuff. There's a lot of anti-fogging agents out there, but for the most part, in a lot of these matches, I'm not saying all, a lot of these matches, if it's a scoped PRS style match, they don't always require uh, glasses. Now, if you have prescription lenses, then you probably want to check at like, you know, one of your optometrist places. Um, Back, Charles. Or, and, and just check with them. Charles, thanks for joining and I appreciate the feedback. Uh, I don't know. I'm not talking about the scope because I think he was asking about glasses. I don't put much on my scope because you have a lot of coatings on your scope lenses and I don't want to take a, take a chance of, of tearing any of those off, especially, you know, when you get into spotting scopes and some of them are fluorite coated and everything. I don't know if I would do that. Uh, typically, I'm keeping that just down to water and or like a microfiber, but dust it off first. No dust or dirt whatsoever on the lens. I just put two inch white masking tape on the card, but throw away your trash. Yeah, Brian, that was my biggest thing with it. Is so many guys, just like tear offs at a racetrack, you just see them everywhere. You got, you got to throw that stuff away. But yeah, it's a great option. Just write on the tape and then rip it off. Uh, there was something I was going to mention before I got out of here. I cannot remember. Anything you want to add before I shut it down? Um. Nope. Well, guys, I know it might have been boring. I hope you enjoyed it. It was, uh, I think it was. It was good information for those that might have the newer ones. I appreciate each and every one of you, all 120 of you that are on here right now. And I hope you guys have a great, great weekend. Rick comes back in and he'll be in the, he'll be in the house, in his house. Uh, I think he come back some, comes back on Monday. And then we're going to be all prepping up for the rimfire match. Yeah, I know I need to shave, Rick. You keep it up, I'm going to rearrange your wall. <laughs> M. Bailey, 6x47 or 6.5x47? Funny you should mention that. I've been having a long conversation with uh, Ken over at Eagle Eye because Not you know, he, he built two of my rifles. What's up, Crowderman? Uh, and we talked about it. You're going to get a lot longer barrel life out of that 6.5x47. It has a lot of nodes. It's really easy to load for. Uh, the 6.5x47 is a good option as well. 
you're dealing with a cartridge that's not going to be as finicky as these GTs and Dashers and getting these spacer kits. I'm kind of torn right now. I think the last last conversation I had with Kenny, I'm probably going to go 6x47. Uh, I'm going to have one uh, done up here shortly. Oh, you're going to stick with 6. Uh, I've, got, I've got some 6 Creed's. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the guy that ever jumps around with all this stuff, but I find it kind of intriguing playing around with some of these Wildcat you cartridges. Might, you might as well. Thomas Rowland's getting a new pistol, one to Turi. Uh, my pleasure on the answers. If you guys ever have any questions, you can always drop me an email. I'll try to get everybody uh, answered. I hope you have a great weekend. Stay safe. Night walking. Keep the head on a swivel and stay ready. Have a good night. Guys, have a good one.